Good afternoon, all. I will provide you updates on the drones and the new technologies representing the African Union Commission. I happen to note that uh, Mr. Eric has just arrived from African Union Commission, and I'm sure that uh, I will not be in conflict with his responsibilities. I will take you through the African Union perspectives, governance of drone operations, and in this governance issues, I will give you a highlight on what AFCAC is expected on the governance of drone operations based on the AUC decisions. I may give you some examples of member states, African member states, the information provided through NEPAD. And I'll uh, conclude my presentations. The African Union Commission has established panel on emerging technologies, and the outcome of this panel was endorsed by the Executive Council in January 2018. The panel has recognized that among uh, the emerging technologies, drones have become one of the world's most publicized technologies that are used by almost all sectors of the economy in the continent. In the AU perspective, the panel recommended to the Executive Committee of the African Union that states need to harness drones, particularly for the agriculture sector. There is a need for capacity building program. States should facilitate an enabling infrastructure. There is a need for regulatory framework and strengthening the, its enforcement. The research and the development has to continue and stakeholders' engagement is vital in order to harness this new technology. Upscaling the technology and release its potential will be required for economic development, particularly in line with Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. The African Union Initiative on Emerging Technologies is working in tandem with Pillar 1 and 6 of the Science and Technology Innovation Strategy for Africa. The African Union vision and policy statement is being translated in the work programs of AFCAC, AFCAC being the specialized agency of the African Union on all civil aviation matters. Accordingly, in the three years strategic plan, we'll be working with our member states and particularly with ICAO in the harmonization of the existing legal frameworks, which are required in our continent. AFCAC will be promoting the establishment of common legislative and regulatory framework for all African states so that drones are used widely for the improvement of socioeconomic well-being of Africans. When it comes to the governance of drone operations, the AFCAC perspective is that we believe that developing a drone ecosystem is a state. There is a need for to take action on the following issues. One is the regulatory flexibility. As the operation of the drones requires flexibility, there is a need to have a smart regulation, which can easily be used by the operators and recipient of the service. From the various keynote speech delivered 
it is apparent that users, customers of the drones services are from the agriculture sector, health sector, and other, uh, surveillance and mapping. Therefore, we will, this service will not be only targeting a specific uh, audience or recipient of the service. Domestic technological development and deployment. We have seen that Rwanda is progressing in the technological development and uh, there might be some other African states who are taking uh, this technology and working with the young generation so that we will not be only using drones, we should be manufacturing drones. The more manufacturers we have in our continent, the cheaper will be the drones. The specification and other aspects will be handled by the regulators. The institutionalization of skills and training. There is a need for member states to work with local universities, international training organizations, civil societies, and above all, with the regulator. The regulator has to be in the proactive situation to take into consideration this emerging technology is fast, its development is fast, its features are also considering the shortcomings which is in the process of introducing and expanding its services. We have observed that a lot of benefits have been observed in some of our African states, among which is Tanzania, as mentioned early on, on the mapping exercise, Rwanda on the delivery of health care items. We have uh, listened today by His Excellency that this service is beyond is not limited only to the health sector. It's being expanded to, us, to other sectors as well. Burkina Faso, South Africa, Namibia, and Gabon, they are working on the monitoring and protection of their wild lives. Mozambique is also using it for crop protection and farming. In conclusion, Drone technology is expanding at the exponential scale in Africa, and agriculture is one of the top economic sectors where they are being used. Member states need to develop and enact flexible. I would like to give emphasis on this flexibility of the standard regulatory frameworks, which should ensure safety while encouraging innovation. I haven't mentioned the security aspect of it. I will leave it for your discussion. The introduction of drone, be it for private use or otherwise, will have a security concern which needs to be addressed as well. All stakeholders should be engaged in all aspects related to the development of drones technology so that the potential resist resistance which may which we may encounter will be well understood and we should also address it systematically. There is a need to conduct public awareness and capacity building around drones, their utilization and the application for civil service as distinguished from the military use. Working with ICAO is critical in sharing of best practices and also to address the concerns on the potential conflict within the controlled zone. There is a controlled air traffic management which is manned where if we are going to introduce unmanned operation in control zone, there is a need to work with ICAO which is responsible and which is also in the proactive way to address this issue. There is 
a need to enhance national and regional collaborations. One of the issue the question raised was how to use drones across a border of a country. There is a need to establish regional collaborations. Networks and knowledge exchange to facilitate ups upscaling and use of drone technology is a must. It is a new technology with features of change frequently, therefore there is a need to have a networking. Among the network which we need is this forum. The next three days is expected that states, regulators, and prospective operators, manufacturers, they should benefit from this kind of forum. The other aspect of it, before I conclude, is that in two weeks' time, the Federal Aviation Authority of the USA and the government of Rwanda will be conducting a workshop on the operation and regulatory framework of, on the use of drones. I appeal to the director generals present here, please make sure that the appropriate inspectors attend the workshop which will start 17 February here in Rwanda. With this note, thank you. Thank you very, very much for those words and your statement, which gives the over, overarching perspective from the African Union. Uh, I now kindly call on Mr. David Manley. He's from Senegal. Uh, he's a policy analyst, Directorate of Science, Technology, and Innovation in the Office of the President. At least we get to know what's going on with our brothers in West Africa. Welcome. Big hand for him. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, David Manley from Sierra Leone, West Africa. It's always had standing to address an audience after they had lunch, especially one as good as we just had. So I endeavor to keep my presentation very, very short. I bring you greetings from Sierra Leone, particularly from our Chief Innovation Officer, Dr. Moina David Senge. I will endeavor today to give a vision of Sierra Leone's drone program, the actions we've conducted so far, the plans that we have in the future. For me to do that, I'll take you back to take you further. In 1462, a Portuguese explorer, Pedro da Cintia, chanced upon a coast in the western um, side of Africa. He saw rolling hills that were covered by impassable forest. And this was all in the rainy season, so all of this was punctuated by heavy thunder. The crack of thunder that he heard made him think that they were the roars of lions. So he called this place Lion Mountain, Sierra Leone. Today, there are regions in Sierra Leone that are still impassable. Half the year, we also have rains. So these situations are still present. That is the reason why we came up with a vision for our drone program as a nation. The vision we have as the government of Sierra Leone is to build the ecosystem so that we will develop the human capital in the drone sector. That human capital will then be able to address issues of inequality, accessibility, and also issues that have to do with food security. 
Sierra Leone, as I mentioned, is a small country in West Africa, 53% women, and at last count, 57% of the workforce. Majority of that workforce is hired by the government. The goal when we started this program was to build a dedicated drone corridor in West Africa for the use and testing of drones, and also develop the regulatory landscape around that. In furtherance of that work, in November last year, we launched the first drone corridor in West Africa um, to test drones and their use cases. And we situated it specifically, well, the corridor at least, around a university campus. We also have two satellite drop zones that are located around other college campuses. That was so that the students could partake in this endeavor and learn and grow as we all grow together. What do we envisage for the future, at least for the immediate future? In April, we're going to have a President's Drone Challenge that will invite companies, both in Africa and around the world, to come participate in challenges for the four use cases highlighted above. The winners of these challenges will be given seed money to expand outside of the corridor and within the whole Leone. We have been able to do this with the partnerships that we have created. The president, when he came into power, set up an office called the Directorate of Science, Technology, and Innovation, tasked with transforming CLEON into a digital and innovation hub. DSTI last year launched a national innovation and digital strategy that highlighted the need for innovation to leapfrog our development needs. Together with UNICEF, that has been the premier funding partner for the endeavor that we have just highlighted, we also worked with universities and the Sierra Leone Civil Aviation Authority, which is the organization that is mandated to draw up regulations around drone operations. The cornerstone of our vision is gender equality. We know that not just drones, but every fourth industrial revolution skill or technology that's developed has the capacity for intrinsic algorithmic biases because there are not a lot of Africans that are involved in this and there are not a lot of women involved in this. We want to make sure that women are essentially involved in all the work that we do to mitigate against those biases and because we know that if women are empowered with fourth industrial revolution skills, we'll have a stronger workforce and a better economy. Another cornerstone is accessibility. The story I told about the founding of our country highlights the need of the disparity between accessibility needs. Rural and urban societies have different experiences when it comes to accessing health centers. Drones will be able to mitigate that disparity. Connectivity is also another cornerstone. We want to make sure that all schools in Sierra Leone have access to connectivity so that they'll be able to learn and grow. As a government, we seek trustworthy and credible partners interested in a long-term commitment to a relationship with Sierra Leone regarding our national identity and culture as we explore solutions to all our needs. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. That is inspiring to see how our colleagues, our brothers and sisters, are trying to use drones for social development. Uh, I have a slight problem. My time seems to be blotted a little bit, so I have to stand up. Uh, so if you could join me in doing that, and then when you stand, please let's fill in these front rows. That way, at least when your picture is taken, you won't have an empty seat next to you. Can we do that, please? 
especially for those who are full. So let's fill in these front chairs, please, and move forward, please. Thank you for keeping me company as I stand and exercising my, after the heavy meal that we had. <laughs> ah, wonderful. So fill in the red chairs as front forward as we can, please. Our students, you can also come in front. Yes. Ah, thank you so much. Ah. It, you know, the food gets circulated and it gets digested quickly because we need to do this. We have a big reception when we finish here. So you, you need to clear some space for that reception and, and the drinks and the bites that we're going to have later on. So now, um, as we settle in, Village Rich is next. Village Rich, uh, this is uh, Mr. Akimid Makaya. And Village Rich is one that does analysis and reports and they did a wonderful one for us in terms of the benefits of using fabrication labs and how they impact the community, the hospitals, and the community. So you're welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. So it's really a pleasure for me to join this uh, African Drone Forum and share our experience in introducing drone into the supply chain of the health in Democratic Republic of Congo. So. We can start with the context. The Next Gen Initiative started in Equator at 2015. Equator is one of 26 provinces in Democratic Republic of Congo. Then currently the initiative has scaled hope to other provinces in DRC as Tanganyika, Olomami, Kwilu, and very soon we hope to go to Sankuru. So let me talk to you with the Equator, because Equator is one of the provinces that we have started this initiative. The provinces of the Equator is more particular, because it is very large four times the size of Rwanda, with the population which is more dispersed in the remote area, divided by Congo River, or the rivers and the dense forest. This combined with the poor infrastructure makes the distribution product in Equator logistically more challenging. As a result, a health facility had high rate of stock out and the weak immunization coverage. So in response, the government, through the Ministry of the Head and Village Reach, started the Next Gen Initiative to improve the availability of the vaccine by making the direct delivery at the health facilities. However, this direct delivery have more risk in the same time for the quality of the product and also the human life. Added to this, 
the direct delivery have request more operation cost and the time to reach the remote area. Then that's why we are we believe that the, di the B direction drone transportation could be more effective and costly efficient to improve the next gen initiative. So what happened in Equator last year in the Democratic Republic of Congo? It was early in August of 2019 that we have the drone demonstration for the first time in the country. The drone flew between the Hippai Provincial Vaccine Distribution Center in Mbandaka, the capital of the Equator, to the real health center of the Wijifake, from where the distance is 40 kilometers. So keep in mind that the, this distance need three hours by car, but only 20 minutes by drone. During this, those five days of drone demonstration, two drones of Sopairo flew and landed in the Equator and with Jifake. So it was amazing. So what was the key result obtained during this first phase? As you see, we did 50 flight. It means 25 the round trip between Wejifake and Mbandaka. The drone went with the vaccines, syringes, and essential medicine to reach Wejifake, from where we are serving all the four health uh, area to vaccine 217 children. Those vaccines can be used for three months for those population. So to improve our bidirection drone transportation, the drone came back with the lab sample, the report, and the vaccines expired. Then during those operations, make sure that the cold chain was monitored and there is no concern for the quality of the product and also the safety of the human resource. So the last one key result obtained was the quick adoption by the provincial HIPAA staff and the health worker in the local after basic training. So look in picture this first flight demo demonstration in the Republic Democratic of Congo. As you see, this is the takeoff of the drone transporting vaccines and for the first time in DRC. And everyone came to see this experience and was amazing to see that. This, is, this was the departure point. So in the Hariva point, there was also the same re reaction to the population of the Wijifake, where is the one of the health center in the remote area. The population of this um, village, when they saw the drone landing, they was so amazing. So here is, as we have seen above, an example of the quick adoption of the F worker. Then when the drone landed, themselves came and opened the drone, pick up the product without any assistance. So just after receiving those uh, vaccines, as you see, is Mr. Emmanuel Bosala, who is the health uh, facility manager, who start, started to, to immunize those children who was there. So what was our strategy to reach this success in the, sec in the first phase of our uh, project? So keep in mind that DRC previously 
had very limited experience on drone. So early in 2019, the Ministry of the Head and the Village of Rich conducted a study to help understand and community perception about the drone. When we spoke to 10,000 of the stakeholders in the national, provincial, and community or the remote area, we focused our meeting intervention to the governance, aviation, and the health regulation, technology, and also the accessibility acceptability of the communities. To show an engagement of the governors, the Ministry of the Head of the Republic Democratic of Congo established the National F Commission for the Drone for the Aid, and in the provincial level, the workshop to observe the drone fight and help to manage the question daily. And uh, Again, the Ministry of the Head and the HIPAI helped whole organization to determine the quantity of the immunization product to send to each health facilities around Wijifake. And they elaborated also the standard operation procedure as the SOP and conducted the community sensitization. So, the DRC Civil Aviation provided the approval to the drone company and they agree with this drone company. They are making the plans to import the drone in DRC. In the global level, Sopiro has selected as the drone company to conduct this B-direction transport. So, what was the key lesson learned through this experience? There are more, so let me talk you four of them. The first one, it was the two-way transportation. As you see above, the drone went from Bandaka to Wijifake with the vaccines, essential medicine, and syringes. But they came back with all the product, lab sample, the report, and the vaccine experiment from Wijifake to reach Mbandaka. It was amazing. Another key lesson learned, it was the strong partnership. There was a strong partnership between the private and the public sector. So another one, and to understand the stakeholder awareness and perception. It was critical to know how the community will appreciate this uh, drone use, and they were so very happy to see this drone and to use it for to make the rapid delivery at the last mile. So the last one is the phased rollout. It was another lesson that allowed us to succeed. So what is the next step? Okay, the Ministry of Democratic Republic of Congo is planning with the collaboration of Village Ridge to start the second phase in implementing the direct delivery by drone very early of the March 2020. We aim to begin the routine delivery for the vaccine and other product in Equator. And as soon as it's possible, we are also ready to do an emergency delivery as needed. Another goal for this second phase is to build the capacity of local staff in the use of drone in the direct delivery to conduct an impact evaluation, supply chain performance, and cost effectiveness, and also to build the strong partnership for sustainability. So, as you see, when every one of us contribute to allow all of those activity, we can achieve our uh, second phase and to help more life in Democratic Republic of Congo. So, thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much. Uh, the key thing here is stakeholder involvement. I think we generally tend to forget that. The people we're trying to service also have to have an idea of what we're trying to do. So stakeholder engagement is very, very crucial. We now go to the next speaker, uh, Mr. Antonio Beleza. He is the Deputy Director of the National Emergency Operations Center, the National Institute for Disaster Management. Please welcome. A big hand for him, please. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. So, and I would like to firstly thank the organizers uh, for inviting us to be here and uh, to be part of this initiative. So, uh, my presentation will be on the implementing drones for preparedness and response in Mozambique. Uh, okay. Uh, that in 2017, uh, WFP uh, developed the use of uh, drones for humanitarian assistance. So, with support with the, by the Belgian, uh, Belgian government, WFP developed uh, the US, uh, the drone coordination model, and it's implementing a training package uh, divided in three models called Let's Fly, Let's Map, and Let's Coordinate building uh, local capacity of staff, partners, and the humanitarian uh, community. Mozambique was one of the countries that benefited uh, from this uh, initiative. Uh, there were a pilot study, uh, five countries were elected, and Mozambique was one of them. And in uh, September 2018, we did our first uh, training on the first module, which is uh, the Let's, Let's Fly training which is more focused on the use of drones, the getting, getting to use to drones. I'm talking about fixed wings and multi-rotor drones. So uh, part of our team deployed to Madagascar to join uh, in this South South collaboration, and we were trained there. Uh, months later, uh, we conducted the second, the second training in Mozambique, uh, which was uh, the, the, the Let's Map uh, uh, module uh, that was focused on uh, using the image that the drone gets to produce high detail, high resolution uh, maps. And uh, after that, we had three, uh, three cyclones in, in Mozambique in, 20, in January, since January uh, uh, 2019, the tropical depression, Desmond, and then we have tropical cyclone, Idai, and then uh, the, the tropical uh, cyclone, Kenneth. So we went for the response, but I'll talk a bit later uh, about this. Because of the amount of data that we gather from, from, from the field, and then we decided to do another training, which, uh, which was called uh, the deep machine learning training, uh, focused on, on uh, developing a co a, a artificial intelligence co co coefficient that could, uh, that could uh, identify and detect uh, building and count the totally and partially uh, destroyed building. So we did that in, in June 2019. But before the, 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 our, uh, our rainy season started in, in 2019, uh, in Mozambique, the, the, the rainy season starts in October and ends in, in, in uh, April. Uh, before it started, we decided to do the, the, this high-resolution uh, drone mapping. Uh, so we conducted this high-resolution drone mapping in September in one of the major uh, concerned rivers which, uh, called uh, Likungu River Basin in central Mozambique. But before we went there, we trained people on how to use uh, EBX's drone, fixed-wing drones, so that we could get very high detailed information for, for the mapping that we, we, we were planning to, planning to do. Uh, Looking at the response side, uh, the first and the very, uh, the very first time that Mozambique, uh, the, 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 the government of Mozambique used drones officially was during the tropical depression uh, uh, Desmond that hit the central, the central part of Mozambique. So we deployed a small team that was tasked to 
tracking the flood waters and chart better uh, evacuation evacuation uh, evacuation centers, uh, so that we could. Uh, put these people, the affected people, into these, these evacuation centers. But because uh, the, 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 the drones that we, were, uh, the tech, uh, the, that we deployed, they, were, they couldn't do uh, much, and the city was totally, I mean, almost totally affected by, by, by these floodings. So that uh, drone team uh, used the images that they could get from the ground, and uh, those images were integrated in the real time and for the, fir the very first time into the European Co Union's Copernicus Emergency Mapping Service, which was activated uh, at the request of the, the United Nations. I'm talking about WFE in this case, on the 22nd of January to conduct rapid assessments and flooded, uh, in, the, in the flooded areas. So we could, in real time, we could identify where there were places uh, that were not flooded so that we could, we could establish our temporary temporary accommodation centers to move these people to those accommodation centers as the city was totally, almost totally, totally flooded by this tropical depression. Uh, three, three months later, we had uh, two cyclones in Mozambique hitting the central and northern part of Mozambique. I'm talking about uh, so, trop, trop, tropical cyclone Idai and tropical cyclone Kenneth that hit uh, Beira and, 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 uh, and um, Cap Delgado. So, because this was too big, and uh, the government of Mozambique decided to uh, request uh, for the international assistance. So in that time, we requested the, the, the people from, uh, I mean, the, the WFP personnel that trained, trained us to come and support us on the disaster response, or to respond to these two, two cyclones. And this was the very first time that WFP used drones officially for disaster response. So the activities that we carried out was related to coordination, search and rescue, assessment, I'm talking about in terms of damage and in terms of logistics, and we could uh, conduct some, some drone mapping uh, during, during the response. So these images show uh, a, a, a bit of what 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 happened. Uh, looking at the looking to the to, to the outcomes that we could uh, get from from these two responses, uh, we we deployed for for the tropical cyclone uh, Idai, which was uh, the, the impacts were much bigger than the Kenneth response. We deployed 16 drones. Uh, we could get uh, more than one terabyte of uh, raw data, and I'm talking about uh, around 60,000 images that we need. We, we we had to process and bring inform. I mean, bring uh, uh, reliable information for decision for real-time decision making. In terms of uh, the, the the tropical Kenneth res response, uh, because it was a uh, localized uh, uh, disaster, we only deployed seven drones. And uh, we, we, we got, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 144 gigs of uh, raw data that, you, that we, we, we process and, and, and use for the decision, decision making. So these are the, some of the, the outcomes that we could get from the, these two responses. But the very important thing here is that we could, in real time, support more than 20 organi organizations that were in the field. Looking, looking at the, looking at the, 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 the preparedness side, uh, we did uh, in January 2019. Uh, a drop, I mean, uh, in, in September 2019, uh, we we conducted this uh, large-scale drone drone mapping, producing high-resolution uh, 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 high-resolution uh, um, outputs. I'm talking about here. Uh, here I'm talking about uh, the digital elevation models and uh, auto mosaic that are using uh, uh, that we are using to 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 develop a 2D and 3D model for flood monitoring. Uh, and you can see from some, some, some of the, the, the outputs and uh, outcomes of, of the, the, the project that, that we just did. Uh, we just mapped an area of 160 kilometers squares in three weeks. So it took us like three weeks to do uh, 116 kilometers squares and produce these high resolution details, uh, high resolution uh, products that we are now using to, 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 to monitoring the, the, in real time to monitoring uh, floods into this, uh, uh, this river called Likungu River. So um, 
Now that I'm talking, there are people in the ground. We are trying to validate the model because we did it in September, and it takes a long. It takes long because of the amount of the data that we we could collect. Uh, it took long for us to process the data and come out with these high details re results. So now I'm showing on that slide. I'm showing a sample of that uh, of a sample of that results uh, in an area called Mokuba, uh, which was affected in, 20, in, the, in the floods of 2015. So what we did here is uh, you can see from the right side, from the left side of the slides, uh, that number is my number. I was using WhatsApp to tell them the people that we deployed in real time the level of uh, level of the river, and we could from that from the, the the, the, the digital elevation model, we could simulate how, 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 how um, where that dead water could reach and how many houses were there and how many people would be affected by that situation. But the thing, the good thing is that even before uh, that uh, happened, that was in January, three weeks, two, three, three weeks ago, uh, we still having, uh, facing the same thing, and we developed a, a live uh, web tool so that we can monitor, the, monitor that, and we do get information from the National Directorate from Waters, uh, information about regarding the river, and we know that the, 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 the river alert is five, five meters, and then we can simulate, you can see from, 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 from the slide, uh, it, it loops uh, into different different uh, water levels, and it shows where the water was reaching. And we had teams validating the, the model that we just developed for for for, for real time decision making. So, uh, why do I consider Mozambique as uh, a success uh, in implementing this? First, uh, it's it's related to coordination. Uh, during the emergency response, INGC, which is the National Institute for Disaster Management, was able, was in control of all the drone activities. The second, the second thing is that uh, we build expertise uh, even before uh, those, 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 those cyclones came. So we built before the cyclones hit, hit Mozambique. And the third thing is uh, experience. So every time that we, we, were, we were doing the, those trainings, we would carry out simulations, activities during the, the, these, these trainings. The fourth thing is equipment on hand. So both INGC and WFP and partners, we had equipment even before these cyclones uh, hit, hit Mozambique. And the last thing here that I want to share is uh, we build relationship, relationship with each other. We build trust, not only with civil aviation authorities, not only with the all, all, all partners that were in the ground, even with the community itself. We build trust with them. And we knew how to operate, how to work together efficiently. And the last thing is that we were able to, t to hit the ground uh, running. I mean, we were able to be there even before those, the, the, this, this, the, the, the disaster strikes in Mozambique. Uh, some of the lessons learned, not, they, are, they are not all the lessons that we could learn, but uh, one is that um, during emergency response, uh, we learned that we always you, you have to utilize the main aircraft operation cell or desk to, desk to communicate flight plans and the completion to operate safely. The second thing, the second thing is uh, standardizing collection collection areas and data set labeling to allow for accurate uh, tracking of the time and locations. The third thing is that we need to prepare an outline of all mapping areas well before uh, we, we, you, you reach, you reach uh, 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 the site, as you may not have internet access or the ability to cycle in the site uh, to define the mapping, the mapping area. Uh, the other thing is that I want to show is that complementing drone data gathering with machine learning analysis capacity like DEEP is essential to improve the information value chain and decision making in disaster response. Uh, the other lesson learned is that we, we have to always ensure that we know what quality data we are looking for. Uh, otherwise, if you you, you end up losing, losing time, getting high-resolution information while you don't, you don't want to use it. Uh, the, 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 sixth, the, the sixth point is that we have to ensure that uh, there is power and equipment charging plan, plan with defined roles to ensure equipment is, uh, that the equipment is operational. And lastly, is uh, we always have to have a backup in place. If you're using a new drone, make sure you have your 
all drawn along just in case something goes wrong. That happens when we were doing the, the, the Lekungu project. We lost one drone uh, because of uh, internal issues. We lost one drone. But the thing is, we, we had uh, the old drones with us. We could carry out the, 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 the map, the project, and we, see we successfully uh, did the job in, 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 in on the time that we were supposed to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, before I call the next speaker, who is Madame Isabel Umuguaneza, who is the Deputy Managing Director for Rwanda Airports Company, uh, I, I was talking about uh, mindset. The talk we just had uh, in terms of the usage of drones for uh, real-time delivery and artificial intelligence, the background, do giving you real-life data. Two things I wish to say with regards to that. One, in ICT we say garbage in, garbage out, so the issue of data is very, very important, what you get in. But let me give you something as food for thought. In Africa, accidents are the major cause of deaths on our continent, more than diseases to a certain extent. And now I was just thinking, if you were to have a, an accident and people need triage to get medical attention, usually we stop another car that is coming and we put the, uh, the, uh, those who are involved in an accident who are maybe broken leg or whatever into a car and take them to the nearest hospital. Sometimes during that journey, the person dies or passes away. Now, what if you could have triage being done with a doctor using a drone to try and stabilize the patient before you put them in the car to go to the nearest clinic. It's food for thought, you know, basically. So something to think about in terms of the efficacy of using drones for social good and for the well-being of our people. Uh, I may now call on Madam Isabel to come and give us our words of wisdom. You're welcome, madam. A hand for her, please. <laughs> finally, finally we get a lady, you know, but that's why we kept you to be the last one, you know. <laughs> Mr. Kamal. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, George, for the very kind intro introduction. Um, I cannot guarantee wisdom will come from this presentation, but I can guarantee it will be brief. And so um, I also uh, apologize, although I may seem young, I'm not as um, ICT friendly as other young people, so I do not actually have any audiovisual behind me. So I hope that um, uh, my facial expression suffices <laughs> and the intonation of my voice. So I want to welcome you all again to Rwanda. Uh, it's very exciting for us to have you here to discuss the potential that drones can have in our society. Um, instead of going project by project, what we've done in this country, I think that what could be more beneficial is to understand the narrative that drives our decision making and that drives our strategies. And before I dive into the strategies or the narrative, I'd like to tell you a story that I learned actually yesterday as we were going to Karonji. I was told that um, the oldest calculator in the world was discovered on the border of Rwanda and Congo. And it's actually called Ishango. And it was made out of a bone of a gorilla leg. And um, at first, when I was told, uh, being uh, the, in, uh, not very imaginative, I, I imagined an actual calculator made of bone and someone typing in one. But that's not actually what it looks like. So it's a long bone, and there are lines drawn in it. And those lines are mathematical. Um, I would say formulas uh, to remember uh, how numbers add up or how to um, recognize prime numbers. And this calculator is 22,000 years old. So I'd like for us to digest this fact for a moment. A lot of conferences or lots of messages that come through is that Africa needs to innovate. And it sounds like this innovation is going to come from outside, from some other more advanced society. But actually, if we look at our history, um, Africans have been innovating all along, and Africans have been steeped in science all along. If you look at our art, 
um, for example, the Rwandan Imigongo, which you can find um, downstairs, I believe, or any other shop, it has uh, geometrical shapes. And if you look at the games that people play um, in the countryside or in their homes here, it also follows um, a mathematical formula. Um, we have plenty of people in the room who can tell you about the Imigongo and can tell you about uh, these games. But I wanted the young people, especially in the room, young Rwandans, fellow young Africans, to know that science is indeed part of our culture. It's not something that's imported from outside. So that's the first step for Rwanda. That's the mindset that we have, that we have all the solutions that we need right here. Solutions or mindsets or history are not enough. We also need to have a vision for the way forward. And our vision is to think big, uh, to not limit ourselves to what we see today, uh, but to commit ourselves to do whatever is possible uh, to reach a sustainable development. Uh, one of the key policies uh, is Vision 2050, and essentially what Rwanda is aiming to do is to become a knowledge-based economy by 2050. And the way to become a knowledge-based economy is for knowledge to reach all citizens equally. And that's where the beauty of the internet lies, where you can have free and uniform access to internet. So what Rwanda has done so far is to make sure that the underlying infrastructure is available for young people to exploit. So all the major roads in the country, all provinces have fiber optic laid underneath them. And that's what has allowed us to do what we are able to do today uh, with Zipline and other drone companies. We also have targets uh, for ourselves, which is to have broadband access for all by 2024, and also to have our population be digitally literate uh, so that we don't only have the infrastructure or have the internet access, but people have the tools to be able to exploit this infrastructure. One last point that is critical to our national vision is for government services to be accessible to all. Um, our goal is to be able to have um, government services accessible 24, days, uh, 24 hours and seven days out of the week. And that can only be done online because, again, human resources could be limited by time. Uh, one example of the government services that we offer uh, is the license uh, or activity permits that the CA offers to drone operators. This allows us to receive a request from anywhere in the world and turn back to them within 48 hours or less if the request is a familiar one or someone already has a commercial license. This, again, is made possible by us having um, uniform access to information and to requests to be made. But for this system to be able to reach the goals of having a knowledge-based economy is for, obviously, our citizens to have knowledge and to have the skills to be able to create, again, equal opportunities and to be able to create jobs. So one of the approaches that Rwanda has taken is to bring uh, students that have an interest in AI, in IT, together and bring them in labs to innovate together. Some were mentioned by the Minister of Infrastructure, like K-Lab. Um, there's also Leaper Lab that is solely focused on uh, drones and AI. Um, there's also a Center of Excellence at the University of Rwanda. And then there's also technical colleges, where these students may not necessarily have all the facilities of an innovation lab, but they're steeped in STEM. And yesterday, when we went to launch the flying competitions in Karongi, we made sure to make a stop at the IPRC there, which is a technical college, and showed to the kids there, and they're here today as well, that it's possible to learn how to fly a drone within a 30-minute session. They may not know all the safety regulations, I hope the regulars in the room will bear with that, but they will at least have the mechanics in mind and they'll have that first impression that this thing that I'm seeing on TV or that I've heard about on, 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 on the radio is actually right here in front of me. It's not that difficult. It's sort of like a game. And even if you have never played video games, within a few minutes you get the concepts. And that opening of minds for our young people is critical so that they understand that drones isn't something that someone else out there with many more years of experience should be able to operate, but I can do so myself. I've seen it in my school. I'm 16 years old, and maybe by the time I'm 25, I can have my own company. And speaking of companies, in order to build a drone industry and not just have two or three giants in the drone um, business, we need to have uh, an ecosystem, which I believe was also mentioned earlier. For a healthy ecosystem to be present, we need to have a healthy demand for drone services. And a healthy demand for drone services means that we are addressing the current needs of our population. What are the problem statements that we can solve today that would actually have an impact? 
as of now, we have many sectors that uh, we utilize drones in. We have the agricultural sector where, uh, as has been mentioned earlier, they're mapping um, our all arable land in the country. There's the health sector that we spoke into at length. I think the innovative application is uh, CARIS with the spraying of um, an, uh, anti larva for the malaria. And there's also in mining, and there's in infrastructure where recently an agreement was reached by the Ministry of Infrastructure to monitor all power lines using drones. So we need to have, yes, different sectors that we apply drones in, but we need to have a demand for services uh, at a reasonable price and also with the capability to maintain these drones locally. Otherwise, you find yourself with demand for a service, but with a provider that is based so far away that the cost of the service is not worth it. So one way to create this kind of industry is to innovate in an incubator uh, or a drone operating center, which is what we've been thinking about. One way for this drone operating center to not just be an empty infrastructure that we just place there and invest a lot of money in for nothing to come out of is, again, to address problem statements that are actually urgent, but also make them small enough for us to test them in a short period of time. And one way to do that, uh, that we have identified with our partners at the World Bank, uh, is to have service contracts. So the aim of the competitions that you see is to, yes, see some cool drones flying, yes, to empower people to see that it's possible uh, to fly drones with a fuel cell, as we've seen, but also to see whether it's commercially viable to have a service with a particular ministry. So in Rwanda, we've come up with three use cases. Uh, we thought that we can work with the Ministry of Health to expedite the delivery of medical samples and for the samples to be taken to a referral hospital so the diagnosis comes faster and then the request for medicine also comes faster. And also not just the fast uh, rushing of uh, blood or uh, medicines, but also medical samples. Another case study that was brought to us by uh, the Ministry of Agriculture is the monitoring of uh, fish schools in uh, Lake Kivu. So uh, nicely co-located there, the teams that are going to be competing have a nice preparation to be able to then approach the Ministry of Agriculture to render that service. And we're not the first ones to do that. I believe there's other uh, islands or in the, I think Belize also has a similar um, use of drones. And the last case study is to see how drones can help map and identify areas that are prone to disasters, uh, especially landslides. As you've seen, our topography is prone to that. So how can we use these drones to sample as much land as possible and identify which areas are more prone risk and so we can put in place measures to mitigate it. This is all exciting for us, the operators, for us, the young people, to see these, sorry. I also did not promise uh, not to drop anything, but I hope this presentation <laughs> is uh, addressing some questions you have about Rwanda's journey. But looking beyond Rwanda, these initiatives or these visions cannot go much beyond uh, a theory if we're not able to work with our neighbors and with the world. One um, milestone that was achieved, I would say, with this flying competition was a collaboration with uh, DRC which has a very active airport right in the vicinity of Karongi. And so we were able to bring our technical teams together to sit down and see how to safely deliver these flying competitions. And our teams, which I would like for us to give a round of applause for a moment. <laughs> our teams are technicians from the Civil Aviation, from the Airport Authority, from the Civil Aviation of DRC and the Airport Authority of DRC were not trained in coming up with a flying competition. There is no certificate, there is no clear roadmap, but they sat down in a room and they worked with air traffic controllers and they tried to find ways to mitigate any risk to the population on the ground um, and to any air traffic in the air. And I would like to also recognize the World Bank team that facilitated this workshop, but I just wanna stress the possibility for innovation for people who have been in an, indus in an industry for more than 20 years, once you give them a problem statement that is small enough to tackle, but also compelling enough for authorities to, sup to give support to. So we in Rwanda also believe in engaging our neighbors and engaging the rest of the world to see how we can harmonize standards and how to harmonize regulations. So more cross-border collaborations like we've had with the flying competitions can happen, and in the near future, even have cross-border flights. 
So I will not take much more of your time. I think the biggest amount of time we should be spending is less so in, in panels and in, in uh, photos, although th that is also nice, but in engaging each other concretely to a call to action. What are we going to do as we leave this forum? How can we work together to create the Africa we want? How can we, um, can you join us in this journey and how can we join you in your journey to create a future where, again, all youth are empire, empowered, excuse me, to come up with the solutions to their problems, to be able to create their jobs, and most importantly, to remove the barriers to understanding that technology is the way forward, that it is the future, and that being locked inside just one nation and not looking outwards is definitely not the future. Thank you for your kind attention. I think it's my presentation. If, 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 come down. Okay, so I actually have, you have more of me. There's a panel that I'm moderating, so I'm just looking to George to see. No, just come down for a moment, okay, please. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, what I must say though, uh, you, even though you denied it, there is some wisdom to what you said, you know. So, uh, if I may say that. Um, what I wanted... Now, the whole thing skipped my mind now. You see, that's the problem. When you, when you praise the lady and then everything else disappears from your head. <laughs> I know what I wanted to do. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Mr. Secretary General, can you please come forward, step forward for a moment, please? Yes. Uh, and Rosa, can you please, uh, uh, this is normally what we normally do, so we would like to give, offer you, uh, thank you, huh? thank you, SG. Uh, Mr. David Manley, if you can please come up, and then Mr. Makaya, can you also step up, please? David Manley, thank you so much. Right. Uh, and then if I can have uh, Mr. Beleza. In appreciation for the time and the energy, even though we fed you lunch, but still we appreciating this. <laughs> thank you so much and appreciate it.